Welcome, everyone. Welcome. How's everyone doing? Doing well. Yeah. 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 We spread uh, two cubic feet or two cubic yards of mulch yesterday, so <laughs> we're tired. That's a lot of mulch. <laughs> That's a lot of mulch. <laughs> yeah. We uh, Friday I hung two gates because our gates had, were in bad shape and rehung them and then cleared out a whole back area of our yard because we're meeting a new doggy tomorrow so oh that's, right. oh that's so exciting yeah happy birthday to me even though i'm like <laughs> on the totem pole i'm the least i want the dog the least so <laughs> it's not that i don't want the dog it's just the other three of my family members are more excited about it than i, mm -hmm. I, I get it and we know who's going to dog be have a name. Um, right now it is uh, Ross. But good name, uh, I like that. I think we're going to change it to Rex. Oh, that's cute. Because he's a uh, like a hound dog, maybe like German short hair mix. Oh. So put a bandana around him, total looking like a Rex. You know, <laughs> little doggy uh, cowboy hat. Good to go. <laughs> so. Yeah. So yeah, it's it was it was fun, busy weekend. But um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, our opening prayer. Uh, I I debated what to do, and then when I was reading through and and saw that the author, the writer of the study, had this as our prayer, and I'm like, that's fitting for us as disciples. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought, eh, hey, we don't even need this. But I, I did, the screen is different. It's the CEB, the Common English Bible, because I wanted us to uh, not just pray it from rote memory. I wanted to, us to read it and think about it a little more. Um, and it's an experiment. If it goes awry, it goes awry. Why not? So, uh, but this is going to serve as our opening prayer. And then we'll get into the Gospels and specifically Matthew. So. Our Father, and we pray this together. Okay. Um, our Father who is in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this bread for today. Forgive us the ways we have wronged you. Just, Just as we also forgive, forgive those who have wronged us. us. And don't lead us into temptation, but rescue us from the rest of the For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So uh, tonight we are talking uh, about Matthew, the gospel. Well, First part's the Gospels, and then we're going to get into Matthew. Um, and I've got three main sources I just wanted to throw out, uh, because if I do it now, I don't have to cite every individual thing. Um, I'm using uh, the Bible from Scribes to New Testament for Beginners. That is the uh, quote-unquote textbook we're using. Um, and then a guide to Bible basics, which is the book I mentioned last week. Uh, super handy. I've got my ebook copy. And then the Gospel of Matthew, like the biblical text itself. So I wanted to throw that out so I'm not plagiarizing anybody and all those legal ramifications. So with the Gospels, um, well, what are the Gospels? Well, you had the answer up there and you took it away. <laughs> I, I did. I didn't mean to go forward. <laughs> Well, now I can see your Word document. Yeah, I know. It was. It's on the wrong screen. It shouldn't have been on that screen. Got to move it. There we go. So the Gospels, um, you know, we think the Gospels are just this biography of Jesus telling Jesus' story. And um, the author of the study, this is the quote from that. Gospels are not biographies of the life of Jesus, uh, because if so, they do a weird job of being a biography because they skip 
Like, you know, they have his birth and then they kind of skip his whole childhood until he's 12 and then skip a lot more until he's 30. And then they really don't tell every moment of his life for three years. And even the worst biographer has more information on that. So they really are not biographies. They're witnesses to God's good news as seen in the life, teachings, passion, and resurrection of Jesus. So it, it's as if rather than being a, a biography where someone is writing down all the details of Jesus' life, it's as if, uh, Kirsten, you're telling me about Austin's life and all the things that you've seen in Austin do since you guys have been together. You're not going to give me, if you are, that's amazing if you give me the <laughs> It was really good. Yeah. <laughs> But generally, we don't do that when we're telling a story, being an eyewitness, or when we're giving testimony. We're not going to give this very long, drawn-out biography, and that's what the, the Gospels are. Uh, and Gospel literally means good news, or I'm going to give you a language lesson tonight. Uh, Greek, uh, euangelion. You is Greek for good, and angelion means message. And what does the word angelion look like? Angel. Angel, messenger. So, you know, angel is a messenger. Angelion is the message. So it's good message or good news. Um, so when we say the good news of Jesus Christ, it's another way of saying the gospel. It's a direct translation. Um, the good news is preached by Jesus about the coming reign of God and the life of the world and among God's people. So when Jesus preached, when Jesus was alive, the good news was the kingdom of God, the reign of God. There goes Joan and she's out of here. Um, the, the good news that Jesus preached was about the coming reign, the coming kingdom of God in the life of the world and among God's people. After Jesus uh, was resurrected and ascended to heaven, it became something more. It became a story of, of Jesus and the redemption and peace that Jesus brings to all of humankind. So uh, there's really two kind of why, why it's good news. Good news that Jesus preached and good news that the church preaches and interprets through that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're back. Welcome back. There you go. Um, yeah, I was just saying the good news is really twofold. There's one that Jesus preached when he was alive, which is this coming reign of God, the kingdom of God. Um, in the world and among God's people. And then the good news that the gospel writers in the New Testament church shared, which was that G Christ redeemed humanity uh, through his life and death and brought peace with God for us. So there's this kind of two, uh, two kind of uh, good news uh, when we talk about good news. Normally when we say good news, we mean the latter, meaning Christ came to redeem us and Christ brings us peace with God. Uh, and then the word synoptics. Have y'all heard the word synoptics before? <laughs> yeah. Weatherman uses it all the time. Really? Yeah, a weather map is called a synoptic map. Because all the observations occur at the same time. Okay. I've never heard the word synoptic in a weather setting. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. Because uh, when I hear synoptics, I think of uh, the Gospels, um, you know, we have what are called the synoptic Gospels, Gospels that pretty much follow the same pattern. They tell the same stories, um, almost in the same order, um, and the synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you know, if you read Matthew and then go to Mark and then go to Luke, you're going to read a lot of the same stories. Maybe they're going to be worded a little differently, but everything is going to sound very similar to each other. And then you get to John, and John is, one of these things is not like the other, it's John. Um, John takes a very different approach when he wrote the gospel uh, for good reason. We'll get into that in a couple of weeks. Uh, but the synoptic gospels are the gospels that are very similar to each other. They follow the same pattern, tell the same stories. Um, normally when we, uh, you know, we have what's called the lectionary in our church, in our tradition, where the preacher will, you know, uh, one year is uh, focused, the gospel passages usually focus on Matthew and then Mark and then Luke. Uh, John is not always in the, uh, 
the, uh, the lectionary because it's not one of the synoptic gospels. Um, there's actually a book you can buy, a, a synoptic gospel, and it has all three, and it tells the life of Jesus and then brings uh, where each of those passages are because so you can read them and say, oh, so that's how Matthew's different from Luke because Matthew's rec recording of the uh, Lord's Prayer is going to be different than uh, Luke's recording of the Lord's Prayer. Um, so you can see how each of the Gospels vary. And there's reasons behind that. We'll get into why Matthew's different and why Matthew does what Matthew does. Um, and the Gospels can uh, be arranged to cover four main periods of Jesus' life. And those periods are intro or the birth, uh, the ministry of Jesus, which is like AD 30 to AD 33, the passion of Jesus, which is not Jesus' love life. Uh, it's the last <laughs> week of Jesus, uh, of his life. Uh, and then the resurrection, which is Easter to uh, his ascension. So... Uh, and then you can see that's a fun little graphic there. Uh, you can see, and this is from the uh, textbook, Bible from Scratch, um, how much each of the Gospels focus on those four things. You know, Matthew has two chapters on the intro to birth, 18 chapters of ministry, seven chapters of passion, and one on resurrection. And then Mark, uh, I always tell Mark he's kind of like the dragnet of the uh, – the Gospels is like, just the facts, man, just the facts. And so the beginning, he's like right into it. Three verses for the intro, uh, 10 chapters on ministry, five on the passion, eight verses on the resurrection. And there's even debate about those eight verses. Um, Luke, 24 chapters, three on the intro to birth, um, 15 chapters on ministry, four chapters on the passion, one on the resurrection. John is the oddball. Uh, and you can see all of that. So, uh, and that is in the, um, the, the, this, if you want a copy of that graphic, let me know and I can send it. Uh, because even I, the quality was fine, but now in the presentation, the quality doesn't look great. So, but I can, I can send that to y'all if you'd like it. Um, and just scale, I think is a big thing. Um, you know, we think, oh, Jesus did all this traveling, and particularly in a modern world, um, traveling in a car, 120 miles, that's just two hours, maybe an hour and a half if you drive really fast, an hour if you drive exceptionally fast. Um, <laughs> but Jesus didn't travel that much. Uh, if you look at the land of Israel, uh, from the Mediterranean Sea to the Dead Sea, which is uh, bottom middle there, that's only about 60 kilometers, maybe 70 kilometers. Uh, and from north to south, you're looking at maybe 80 to 100 kilometers. So it's not a large area uh, of Palestine. And then Jesus, you know, was in, uh, born in Nazareth. I mean, aside from going to Egypt as a kid and then coming back, he didn't travel more than 60 miles from his hometown his entire life. Um, so I, to me, the scale is always impressive to look at because, um, you know, we think, oh, Jesus went here, Jesus went there. Jesus didn't go like 120 miles from, you know, his hometown. Um, and he walked, he didn't, you know, ride a horse or whatever. So uh, scale to kind of see the setting of where all these things took place, uh, that's super handy, uh, super informative, at least for me to look at. So we're going to get into Matthew. Um, what do y'all know about Matthew? Anybody? He's a disciple. Okay. The book or the person, Matthew? Because both are important. In the, in the, the book probably was not written by the disciple. <laughs> there, there's debate. Um, we'll, we'll get into authorship issues here shortly. Um, but, uh, was, what, go ahead. It was written. Around, maybe a little earlier than that. I can't remember. Yeah. We'll get into the dating and all of that. Um, cause once again, there's primarily for a Jewish audience. 
Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, what was Matthew's uh, occupation? The person. He was a tax collector. Right. Tax collector, scumbag. Yep. <laughs> um, even now we don't like tax collectors. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, that good stuff. We'll we'll jump into it then. Um, the general outline for today's discussion for the book. We're going to talk about authorship and authorship issues because um, there's debate on that. Uh, if it involves Christianity, there's always a debate on it. Let's be honest. Um, we're going to talk about the date of writing, the intended audience, and uh, interesting question: Why would we? Why is the intended audience important when talking about a book of the Bible? can help you understand some of the meaning mm -hmm. and what was written, give you some context clues. Yeah. Um, Cause you're, I mean, we're reading letters that are not written to us in the 21st century world. Um, they're written to a particular audience. So what the author is trying to communicate to that audience helps illuminate the meaning of the text. So we're not saying, Oh, that means Jesus wants us to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. No, that's, that's in today's context, but in the original context, it might be totally different. So knowing who the audience is is super important when reading scripture. Uh, then we're going to talk about the dating of the writing, uh, an outline of the book, and so we can get a good framework of what the book's about. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the general themes of the book as you're reading the book, uh, things you can remember and watch out for. So authorship. We're going to open a can of worms here. Um, Matthew, but there's debate. Um, there are some, I, I personally believe uh, Matthew was the author of this book. Um, there is debate among some scholars. The author says many, most scholars, and it, no, it's not most scholars believe that. Um, there, there are more than three scholars, so it's many. Many scholars believe it was someone besides Matthew uh, that wrote um, the gospel. Uh, very possibly it was someone from the church at Antioch, according to them, uh, or it was another uh, person um, in, uh, you know, within the, the church. Someone very passionate and believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but they would say it's not Matthew. Personally, I think it was, and one of the big reasons is many of the early church member uh, leaders believed it was Matthew. Um, they had, you know, like the Gospel of Thomas and other fake Gospels or Gnostic Gospels. Um, you know, they were like, no, God, Thomas didn't write this. Um, so they believed it was, you know, the author was the Apostle Matthew. Um, therefore, personally, I believe that. Um, you can make your own decisions. The author of the book does not agree with me. He's wrong, uh, in my opinion. Um, but um, no, I'm kind of joking with that. <laughs> but um, I mean, there, there are differences of opinions and that's totally cool. Um, it really, it doesn't change the authority of the gospel um, because if you look at Matthew uh, and the dating and when it was written, a lot of the framework was possibly taken from the Gospel of Mark, um, a lot of the information. So it was still an eyewitness account of Jesus' life, uh, but it may or may not have been uh, Matthew. Personally, I do believe that, um, and um, I think the arguments for him being the author are stronger than the arguments for him not being an author. Clear as mud? All right. All that to say, you can make your own decision, and that's cool. Um, the date of writing, another controversy here. Um, personally, I would say in the late 60s, because um, Matthew definitely has a hippie vibe. Um, wait, no, wrong 60s. That's, I meant like AD 60s, uh, not 1960s. Um, the, the debate is uh, a lot of people say it was after uh, AD 70. Um, uh, but because, and what happened in 8070, Mike, you probably know. 
Oh, okay. There it is. The destruction of the temple. The destruction of the temple, not just the temple, but all of Jerusalem. Well, yeah, you're pretty much right. Yeah. Um, See, and that's the reason why I don't think Matthew wrote it, because he would have had to have been too old. Yeah, because if you subscribe to the later date, um, which, once again, many, many scholars don't, you know, they do believe it's sometime in the late 50s, maybe even 60s. I personally believe probably late 60s before 80, 70. And, and the reason that 80, 70 date's important is because of that event. The temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was destroyed. Any, any thoughts on why that would be important or a stickler for some people? Well, that, that's the foundation of the whole Jewish religion. Uh, if, if you don't have a temple, you can't sacrifice. If you can't sacrifice, then how can God forgive you of your sins? So, yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. Yeah. But for, for dating, you know, dating purposes of the, the book, why 8070 is big, because Jesus, pro, he, he predicts uh, in one passage that, in fact, do I have it written down? Um, and I didn't do that. He predicts the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. He says, uh, not one stone will be left standing, but the word of God will last forever. Um, and so people, when they hear that, how, how did Jesus know that? How did Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or anyone know that? Um, rather than the simple answer just being, because Jesus is God and he kind of has an idea of how things are going to happen. Um, they they take an, uh, the, some people take a well no that, that had to, it had to be written after AD seventy so because that's how Matthew knew um, that this was going to happen or how because Luke knew this or Mark knew this because it was after AD seventy um, so I, I yeah I, so I think the AD seventy or eighty the later dates. Um, the evidence for those is, is not as good as, as early dates. Um, but also that would go with the authorship issue. I believe Matthew wrote the book of Matthew. Um, that being the case, unless he was going to be 105 years old, it had to be written before 8070. Um, so it kind of is a dog chasing its tail logic, but um, it's that way either way. Either it's not Matthew because he's too old because it was written too late. And so you have this same cycle. So um, personally, I think it was probably mid to late sixties before the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, uh, once again, the dating doesn't matter as far as the authority of the book and the, the, the story of uh, the account of Jesus. It's still valid. It's still true. Uh, the intended audience. So Mike already said the intended audience was Jews. Now, how, why, why would, Mike, why would you think the intended audience of Matthew were, were Jews, was Jews? Well, for one thing, he makes a big deal about uh, Jesus' genealogy. Uh, and he also, uh, whenever he has the chance, shows how, Predicted in the uh, Old Testament with reference uh, to the prophet. Uh, so, so Matthew makes a big deal about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, throughout Matthew, you uh, and we'll get into the genealogy later. Um, but throughout all of Matthew, you have well, Jesus did this to fulfill this, constantly quoting the Old Testament. Um, and if you realize that it was written to a Jewish audience. That totally makes sense. Matthew's making a case that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Um, how does he do that? Because Jesus is fulfilling all of those prophecies. Does that all make sense? Okay. Um, another intended audience is Jewish believers uh, because um, they are, you know, when their cousin or their brother who's not a Jewish Christian or a believer in Jesus 
hears that you believe in this guy named Jesus is the Messiah, they're not going to be too kind. And so it's a, uh, uh, an attempt to reassure them that, yes, Jesus is who he said he was. He is the Messiah to reassure them, to encourage them, but also to strengthen their faith and give them um, some, um, some um, and we'll just call them talking points with their Jewish family and friends. It's like, you know, if you need to talk, how did Jesus do this? Yeah, these are the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. Tell your cousin Peter or, or whatever, tell him that and see what he says. It's almost kind of like that. So it's encouragement for Jewish believers. And then lastly, obviously, the audience is the early church, uh, the early believers of Jesus, uh, who the letter was written to. Kitty. I bring Rory in here, but he's screaming his head off right now. So, This is Nala. <laughs> Very cute, Kirsten. Thanks. And we talked about why uh, knowing the intended audience is important. So we'll skip that part. Um, now the outline of the book. Uh, this part is taken uh, as the synthesis of um, the, uh, the beginner's guide to the Bible and uh, the Bible from scratch book. So um, an outline of the book of Matthew, Matthew one through two is Jesus birth and early years. Uh, so if you have a Bible, and open up to Matthew chapter 1. It's right after Malachi, the Italian prophet. But um, starts off with the genealogy, the birth of Jesus the Messiah. And I'm just reading off the headlines of mine. The visit of the Magi, the escape to Egypt, the massacre of the infants, and the return from Egypt. So that's, that's the uh, genealogy. So the question then becomes, or that I want to ask, is um, why would you begin with a genealogy? Because it's not exciting to read. I mean, unless you're just like into genealogies, then it might be exciting, but apparently I'm not. So, so once again, I guess it's because of the uh, who he's appealing to, his audience would be mostly Jewish, and kind of gives it, kind of helps set up the uh, the righteous angle or why why this is important because he he is one of you. Exactly. And that, that way maybe no the, i think i think there there are actually lots of answers to this one he's presenting a case um he's presenting a case that jesus is the, is the jewish messiah for him to be the messiah he has to come from a very strict lineage he can't just be any willy-nilly um jesus walking around nazareth and be the messiah he has to be you know from a certain lineage. he has to be of the tribe of uh, Benjamin has to be a descendant of David. Um, and, and so the, this is presenting a case from the beginning of time to Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah because he fits all of those molds. Um, there, the, uh, there's a second reason it goes to it being an ancient world. Um, you know, when, uh, well, think of last names. Um, where did last names come from? more than likely. Uh, profession, possibly. Uh, it also delineates uh, lineage. Um, you know, uh, Tolofsson would be a last name and it's the son of Tolof. Uh, so who, who you are um, is not just who you are right now, it's who you come from. Uh, so if I, if, you know, Jesus is who he is, not just because of him being him, but he's coming from this long line of people. He's presenting uh, what kind of right he has to even be a rabbi and a teacher. Um, so genealogy is important for this audience, um, two, to show who Jesus was and to prove that he is the Messiah. Got it? Questions or anything? Comments? Okay, we'll keep going. 
that has the birth narrative, uh, which we're all familiar with because of Christmas. Um, but you know, and we'll get it. We'll we'll cover the the book. Actually, covers the differences between um, Luke and Matthew and the birth narratives. I figured let's not do it today. Let's do it when we get to Luke because it just rather than take talking about a book we're going to talk about in two weeks. Let's do it then. Uh, so you have the birth narrative, his early life, which is the flight to Egypt because um, uh, you know Herod was going to kill all the babies, and then his return to. Apparently, I can't spell, but that's supposed to be Nazareth, not Nazareth. That's the southern version of Nazareth. Um, Nazareth. Uh, next uh, is Matthew 3 through 4, and this is Jesus' preparation for ministry. And it begins with John the Baptist. Um, we can, if you want to turn to your Bibles to 3 and 4, you have... Uh, the proclamation of John the Baptist, the baptism of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus, and Jesus begins his ministry in Galilee, and Jesus ministers to a crowd of people. So you have John the Baptist, and you have the calling of the first disciples, um, and then you have Jesus' baptism, and uh, that whole story of the dove, Spirit of God coming down like a dove, and behold my son in whom I am well pleased listen to him. Um, and then you have the calling of the, first, of the first disciples where Jesus says to them, come follow me. And they drop whatever they were doing. And they go to follow this crazy guy who uh, has some good points. So let's follow this guy. Um, then you have Matthew five through the se five through the seven, five through seven, uh, the sermon on the Mount. Um, quite possibly uh, the most famous sermon in all of history. Um, and uh, a point of trivia, um, what event happened after the Sermon on the Mount? Anyone? It didn't happen in Matthew. Uh, it's recorded in another gospel. Uh, but the Sermon on the Mount, right after that, uh, is the feeding of the 5,000. Um, so. Um, that, that's, and I say that to bring a point that the gospel of Matthew is not, um, organized, uh, chronologically. Um, it's organized in a way that was a logical pattern to Mark and Matthew, uh, but not, you know, it wasn't chronological. So, uh, if you're looking at, uh, if you want to look at the life of Jesus chronologically, go to the book of John. It's organized much more chronologically than the rest of the gospels. So you have the Sermon on the Mount, which, you know, you have the Beatitudes, you have a couple of parables, and then you have a, a ending that sermon where he's teaching the people. Um, and we'll get into some themes of that in just a moment. Uh, next, you have a large chunk of time, Matthew 8 through 18. We won't flip pages for this one. Uh, but this is just a very broad group of Jesus' deeds, the things he did, uh, and teachings around Galilee. And those include miracles of healing where he healed the blind man or he healed the leper or he healed the woman with issues of blood. Uh, miracles over nature, which would include what miracles? Anyone? My favorite one, the calming of the storm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any others? Jesus walking on water. That might be the most cliche miracle he did because you know everyone talks about jesus walking on the water um so miracles over nature and then we have loads and loads and loads of parables question uh worse when wonder people uh, might have an advantage here um, why would jesus teach in parables because parables are like a gift They come in gold boxes and you have to open Yeah. I well, am pushing it. Okay. You just have to talk louder. It's, you have to unwrap it. You have to think. Okay. Um, parables had two purposes. And the first is it reveals kingdom's truth. Um, 
particularly to people who might not be able to understand this large giant concept. Uh, imagine us talking to someone from first century Palestine and trying to describe um, indoor plumbing or uh, recess lighting or anything like that. Um, that concept is so way above them, but you might be able to do it through a story by meeting them where they are. Um, and so that's what God, uh, what Jesus, God as Jesus did. He took this large concept that is too big for us as human beings to comprehend at all um, and brought it down the level through a story uh, so that we could have a glimpse of understanding of what he was trying to say. Parables also, uh, in, in addition to illuminating truth, they also hid truth. Um, because Jesus taught a lot, um, particularly if you're looking at the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he talked a lot about them through the parables. Uh, you know, the wine skin, new, you know, you don't put old, new wine in old wine skins because it's going to burst. You put new wine in new wine skins, and that was a direct reference to the Pharisees and Sadducees without Jesus saying, look, you guys are rotten to the core. Um, God's going to do something different here. You need to get on board. Rather than being direct and being confrontational and being insulting, Jesus does it telling the same thing through a parable, hiding that truth within there. So does that make sense that Jesus both eliminated and hid truth? Okay. So then we have uh, Matthew 21 through 28, Jesus in Jerusalem. Um, this would include the Passion of the Christ, not the movie, uh, but the topic, the arrest, the trial, and the execution of Jesus, uh, including everything that happened the week before where he cleared the temple, where he was anointed in Bethany. All of those things are included in this area of Matthew. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus, you know, where Jesus came back from the grave, the sequel, I guess, of Jesus. Um, and uh, yeah, so that is all Matthew 28, 21 through 28. So that's a really simple outline of everything. So you have G uh, Matthew 1 through 2, which is the birth narrative in the early years. And then you have Matthew 3 through 4, the preparation for ministry. Then you have his, essentially the Sermon on the Mount in the beginning, his first sermon. And the, uh, the, the deeds, the ministry of Jesus. Then you have the last week of Jesus, and then his resurrection. So now we're going to go into the themes of Matthew. Um, and the first theme, if you're reading Matthew, that you're going to get again and again and again and again and again um, is the kingdom of heaven. So what is the kingdom of heaven? According to you. Okay, well, according to Matthew, uh, you have an upside down kingdom. A kingdom that doesn't seem to work on the same laws of physics that our, our kingdoms work on. Um, where the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Where you care about those more than you care about yourselves. You look into others' needs before you look into others. That whole, the, the, the kingdom of God is um, diametrically different than our kingdom, than our world. Um, the logic of the kingdom of God is illogical to us, you know, before. Uh, even to us now, we're like, really, Jesus, are you sure that should be how it's done? Um, it's an upside down kingdom to an outsider's perspective. Um, the foundation of the kingdom of God is love. It's not a constitution. It's not uh, the right to bear arms. It's not military might. It's not um, ethnic purity. The foundation of the kingdom of God is love. It's a new way of living. Um, we're not living for ourselves. We're living for one another. Uh, in the same way, it's a new way of community where we're caring about a group of people beyond ourselves. Um, and that, that's in our local church. 
uh, but also our community and caring for those around us, caring for whoever, who our neighbor is. Uh, another theme is the New Testament cannot be separated from the Old Testament. Now, which president of the United States would disagree with that sentence? Anyone? Thomas Jefferson. Um, he did not like the Old Testament um, at all. He, the Jefferson Bible, literally, he kind of ripped the Old Testament out of the Bible and a lot of supernatural parts of the New Testament, and he had his own little Bible. Uh, but Ma according to Matthew, you can't separate the Old Testament from the New Testament. Um, first, you have Jesus as the new Moses. Uh, Moses in the Jewish tradition is the lawgiver. He brings, he's not the lawgiver, the law bringer. He brings the law of God to the Jewish people. Jesus is that new Moses who's bringing a new, a perfect interpretation of those legal, legal pr pr teachings and a reinterpretation of the law. Does that make sense that Jesus is the new Moses? Okay. But also Jesus is the fulfillment and realization of Old Testament prophecy. Again and again and again, you have Matthew saying, uh, this was done to fulfill this scripture. Um, so if you're reading Matthew, you get a sense that maybe I should read the New Testament or the Old Testament uh, along with the New Testament. So often a lot of us just read that New Testament because let's face it, it's a little easier than the Old Testament. God's a little friendlier in the New Testament than the Old Testament. Um, it doesn't have Leviticus in the New Testament. There's no Leviticus. There's no numbers. Um, there's no like conquering of people and killing of babies and all this stuff in the New Testament. So let's just read this. The problem is to really understand who Jesus is, we can't do that just reading the New Testament. We get an idea, but to get that full picture, we have to read the Old Testament. Um, I don't, I've probably shared this story about a billion times, hyperbole, um, but a friend of mine asked me why Jesus wasn't born or what, didn't die on the Day of Atonement. Uh, which is a festival where a lamb was sacrificed for the sins of the people. That makes sense, right? I mean, Jesus' death was atoning for us, so he should have been killed on the Day of Atonement. But he was killed on the Day of Passover. Why, why, why is that important? Anyone? Well, if you follow, go back to the Old Testament history and, and the whole Exodus, God brings, guides the, the people of Israel to Egypt. Why? Why, why do the people of e e Israel go to Egypt? To escape a famine. To escape a famine. Funny enough, hundreds of years later, when the Israelites are in, you know, wandering in the desert, God gives them manna and feeds them. So before, God could have done the exact same thing. He could have fed them. He could have given them water. But instead, God chose to bring them into Egypt. And then what happens? They get put into slavery. They're building probably not the pyramids or the sphinx. They're building something. They're slaves in building projects for Egypt. And they're crying out, deliver us. And God hears their cry and delivers them out of slavery into freedom, into the promised land. And part of that story is the lamb is slaughtered, the Passover lamb, and the blood is put on the, the mantle of you know, the door frame, the doorpost. And if the, the, the spirit of God, or the angel of death, came across and saw that, it would pass over. But if not, hence the name Passover. Uh, if, if not, it would kill the firstborn of that house. And so a thousand years later, we have Jesus dying on the day of Passover, bringing us from slavery to sin into freedom in, in Christ. And you have the Lamb of God 
when, when the, the angel of death comes across and see the lamb of God covered, you know, we're covered in the lamb's blood, death escapes us, at least the second death, the ultimate death, uh, spiritual death escapes us. And so the whole story of the Passover is so we have a better understanding, a fuller understanding of who Jesus is and what Jesus accomplished on this earth. And by reading the Old Testament, we see throughout all of that, there's so many stories of that if we read, we get a better picture of who God is and who Jesus is and who we are in Christ. Uh, there's a lot of studies we can do on that. I won't get into it because we don't have the time. There's so many. But when we read the Old Testament, we get a better picture, a better idea of who Jesus is and what Jesus has accomplished. Uh, Jesus, the last thing that uh, Matthew is big on is Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. Um, and he said that once again, fulfillment of all those prophetic passages from the, from the Old Testament. Um, but a caveat with that, Jesus isn't like the Messiah the Jewish people were expecting. They were expecting a king, um, an earthly king, a warrior king, uh, one who would drive the Romans out of their land. But instead, they became a Messiah who defeated the great enemy of all humanity, death, destruction, sin. That's, that's the enemy that Jesus overcame. Uh, so the, the Messiah that they were expecting is not the Messiah that the Jewish people got. And that's the last theme of Matthew. Um, so uh, that, that's all of Matthew that we're going to talk about. Um, just a quick... Uh, uh, the whole, all of this that just have a, the last part of it is helping learn Bible skills. Uh, some things you may not know um, at the bottom of your Bible, of the page of the Bible, not like the outside. Like if you go to Matthew one one, beginning of Matthew, and look at the bottom, it'll have these footnotes. And how many of you never read footnotes? Yeah, I never read footnotes. I see like a little one or an A or what in anything I'm reading, uh, it annoys me to read it because it's like I'm in the groove and then I see a footnote and then I have to go read it and it breaks my, no. But a lot of times in the scriptures, uh, the translation will have a footnote that talks, um, that gives something about the translation of scripture. Uh, like in uh, one one. I'm reading from the NRSV, an account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Right after the word genealogy, there's a little A, and there's a footnote at the very bottom. It says, or birth. So this could also be an account of the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. Or, and then it gives another footnote, B, Messiah, Jesus Christ. It could also, because different texts, of ancient texts might use the word Messiah or might use the word Christos or King uh, Jesus Christ. Um, so it's helping us understand um, that there could be text, text what, what's called textual differences, uh, just so we can better understand um, what those are. So we've talked about Matthew 1. Let's go to Matthew 23. 13 through 15. Would someone like to read that? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven, for you do not go in yourselves. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross sea and land to make a single convert and you make the new convert twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. All right. And if you notice, there's a little footnote note, and the bottom says, um, other authorities and other texts may have this. Um, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearances you make long prayers. Therefore you will receive the greater condemnation. Um, so yeah, it's just textual differences, and because uh, y'all y'all may not know this, uh, I was kind of shocked when I first learned we don't have the original manuscript of Matthew of any of the books of the Bible. 
Um, I think there's very good reasons because if we did, holy cow, we would be worshiping those manuscripts like nobody's business rather than the God in whom they talk about. Um, Cause we're stupid people. Humans are more like sheep than I could ever say. Um, and so we don't even have a complete, like maybe first century manuscript. We have fragments and pieces. Uh, and so they, they've taken, they've translated all these pieces, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of little uh, pieces and fragments to create this picture of the gospel that we have. We have more, if you're wondering, we have more fragments of the New Testament of the Bible than we have of any other ancient work. Um, and they vary maybe 4% of the time. And none of those are in major doctrinal issues. They're more like when it says they, it could be he or, or, or she or something, something small and innocuous like that where they disagree. Most of the time they do agree. Um, but if they do have textual variances, which where the text differ from each other, it'll be in those footnotes. Um, and if you've ever talked to someone, I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase KJV only, um, people, Kirsten's like, yeah, um, there, there are people who are KJV only who, um, they only, they believe you should only read the King James version of the Bible. Um, if you're not speaking with these and vowels, you're not doing it right. Uh, but one of their arguments for KJV only are these footnotes because they say, oh, look at all these textual variances. Uh, if you look at the King James, it's complete. It hasn't been changed. Never mind the fact that it's been changed multiple times since the original version of the KJV in 1611. The one they're reading was actually an 1870 revision. Um, so just a fun thing. Uh, if you're interested, if you ever hear someone say the newer translations can't be trusted. Yes, they can. And I think the footnotes are a big reason why, because they say there are textual variances. There are times where the text may differ than what uh, the majority says. So uh, that is Matthew. Any questions, comments? I'm not sure if our chat went through, if we leave you, um, thanks, Michael, and see everybody next week. This computer is set for an automatic restart at 6.30. So, okay. Thanks, well, thanks, thanks to everybody. First Savings Bank. Yeah, <laughs> thanks to the bank. Um, yeah, if you don't have questions, you either did a really good job of teaching or a very bad job. So we'll, we'll uh, assume. Uh, but if you see for next week, uh, if you have the book, read Chapter 3 on Mark. Uh, also, uh, if you would, if you want, if you want to read the e this link uh, it's to the ESV, it's a really good introduction to Mark. Uh, and I purposely am using a very a source that's going to be different than uh, the book itself, because if you have both, it's good to get both both different views. Uh, the ESV is going to be um, uh, more conservative and dating and authorship issues, where the book might be a little more progressive. Um, so, but this is a really good introduction to uh, not just authorship issues, dating issues, but also outline and theme issues. Uh, so it's really good if you can read that for next week before we get meet and talk about Mark. It'd be really good, and hopefully we can have some really good discussion. So, all right, Please thank you. Email that out or put it on Facebook. I will put it on Facebook.